authority, Jesus, that comes to steal and destroy. Lord, you reign. Lord, you reign over all, Jesus. You reign over principality, Jesus. You reign. You reign over our families, Jesus. You reign. You reign over the lost, Jesus. You reign. You reign over the nations, Jesus. It's you. When there's rumors of war, you reign. When there's plagues, you reign. You reign. You reign, Jesus. You reign over every oppression and disease. It's you, Jesus. May we never forget the Lamb that is on the throne. The Lamb that was crucified. Lord, you reign, Jesus. You reign. You reign, Jesus. Lord, your word said that no fear will overtake us, Jesus. And that no harm will come to us, Jesus. Lord, your word says that when thousands fall at her side, it will not touch us, Jesus. Your words as a no arm will overtake us, Jesus. To those who love you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, I believe. Lord, it's there for us to just grab. We just need to reach out and grab it, Jesus, because you have the victory for us. We just need to grab it. Reach out and grab the victory that he's given you. Walk in the victory that he's given you. Walk in the victory that he's given you. He's already given it to you. Just need to walk in the freedom that He's given you. to speak about a subject I don't remember having speaking of before. And I want to share about heavenly assemblies or gatherings of what sometimes happens in heaven and that we're not aware of because we're not told very much about God's world or a lot about our world, a lot about us, about our salvation, but we don't see very much what happens on the other side or what has happened in the other side. I want to speak about heavenly gatherings or special assemblies or maybe even courts that have taken place. We know of a few, but I wonder how often, how long or why we don't know the answers to these questions, but we do know that there are. We always wonder what heaven might be like after this life. And people that sometimes are able to go in their souls or spirits, 
they don't want to come back, so they can't tell us what happens up there. It depends on what part of the heavens, the gatherings take place. It might not even be in paradise or in one of the heavens of the heavens of the heavens, plural of plural of plural that David told us about. So we don't have even many stories from people that have gone to this side. And although a few have had experiences or visions that have died literally for a few minutes or hours, some even cases a few days have woken up in a morgue. But I've just seen a little piece of a paradise. Some have seen maybe a relative or some have seen like the feet of Jesus, but Jesus came down from heaven. He was, it was his home, eternity. And yet he had few things or few times he told his disciples about heaven. But he did tell us a lot about hell, Hades, and how we should do everything possible that we don't want to go there. We shouldn't, we should try to avoid that. Now, one thing Jesus did say to his disciples in the upper room, <clears throat> he said, in my father's house, there are many rooms. In John 14, we read that. An older translation of the Bible says, there are many mansions, like describing that heaven has buildings of some sort. And he did tell us that God was the father. He was a judge. And also talked about Satan that has uh, evidence against people. And uh, he said, uh, the devil's coming, Satan is coming, but he doesn't have any evidence on me. Doesn't have anything on me. So... What's this about Satan gathering evidence? What for? What does he do with it? We know about Satan being the tempter, and Jesus also told us about that, and his, he tempted Jesus. We know about that, and he's the accuser. And we also know about the Holy Spirit being our counselor, paraclete. So one translation would be, that he is our lawyer. So I wonder if it's like a court or something that happens up there. We do know that Jesus said that as we go out, we should not forget as we baptize, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, mentioning those three that are involved in, in, in some trinity we cannot understand in heaven or the counsel of God. We have read about that God has a counsel. Is that the Holy Spirit and the Son? There's, there's so many mysteries we don't know, but by search, searching the scriptures, we can shed just a little bit of light on this subject of, of heavenly assemblies. <clears throat> so is there a heavenly courtroom or assembly? We do hear that there will be a grand court in the end times. Is that made specially or for, for after the world or the judging of nations? Or has there always been that assembly has been like a courthouse? So who is there in those assemblies? What, what goes on? First, let's look at some past heavenly assemblies that we have read about in the scriptures. And it's not very often that we're privy to what happens up there. Privy means to be made participant in knowledge of something that's private or that is secret. And we've only known of a few since man was created. And one of them is, is found in the ancient book of the ancient man called Job. Nobody really knows when that was and what his part was in humanity, but we do know it was a long, long time ago. And we read in verse 6, now there was a day, Job 1, 6. There was a day when the sons of God 
came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now the sons of God are probably referring to angels and, and different types of creations of angels. Because in Job 38, 7, it says, The morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And it was talking about a pre-time before this earth or mankind, humanity. Going back to Job in the next verse, 7, 1, 7, And the Lord said to Satan, From where come you? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down in it. It says one day. Was there many days that this happens? That there's an assembly and, and uh, Satan normally attends those assemblies and God said, What's up? What you been up to? Maybe, I don't know. Was this just one occasion? But at least we know there was an occasion. There was an assembly. They all got together, God's sons. And Satan. And you know the story, how he started uh, accusing uh, Job, when God said, hey, Satan, have you seen my servant Job? And you're going up and down and around the earth. Did you see him? He's a good guy. I like him. And Satan did, sure, of course, but, but, but you like him. And, and yeah, he's a good guy because you're, you're, you, all, you take care of him, you bless him and all this. Well, what a way to, to talk to God. It's sort of like, Accusing him. Yeah, he's nice, but. So, hey, I guess he can get away with that. He's present there, and he has an opinion, and, and he voiced his opinion to God. And, and uh, the devil kind of made a challenge, said, yeah, but uh, what if you don't do that? We'll see. And God said, okay, you're on. And he said, but you can't. Touch his life. And we know the rest of the story, how Job was tempted and, and all the things that came upon him and the victory. And I wonder what happened the next assembly when Satan came up and, and God said, well, what do you think now about Job? We don't know. It's not written. The next occasion we find is in Zechariah chapter 3 in verse 1, where it says that he showed me Joshua the high priest that was standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan was standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. Is this, referring to Joshua the high priest, is not a brand plucked from the fire? And then we, he knew the, the rest of the story when his clothes were changed and, and he was purified and he was able to go into that assembly or whatever was happening at that time. The next occasion we find is in 1 Kings chapter 22. There was a prophet called Micaiah. We haven't heard much of him except in this occasion. It was in the days of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. And we read in 1 Kings 22, 7, And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord besides these prophets that we might inquire of him? Because Jehoshaphat wanted to go to war. And he wanted to make sure that he was going to make it back, that he was going to have a victory. So uh, he brought in his prophets and his prophet, yes, go, it's going to be good. You're going to get a great victory, and this is going to happen. You're going to come back with spoils and all that. But he was just wasn't feeling very well with all their counsel because he had something. He knew about this prophet, Micaiah, 
but he had a problem. It says, uh, verse 8, when he said, Is there not another prophet of the Lord beside all these that we might inquire of them? And the king of Israel, because he was the king of Judah, the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There's yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we inquire of the Lord. So he said, Hey, we got a prophet. We can loan him to you. I've got all these hundreds of prophets that tell me this. But I hate him. <laughs> For he doesn't prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, well, let not the king say so. So can I use your prophet? Well, okay. So we read in verse 9, Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten, hear Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And verse 19, there was a space here. They went and got Micaiah and brought him back. And he said, Hear you therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. And all the hosts of heaven were standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Here we have another assembly, another gathering. What were they talking about? What were they thinking about? What was the reason or the subject of this assembly? We'll soon find out in verse 20. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramath Gilead? And one said, Let's try this. The other said, Let's try that. So evidently in those gatherings, there's, there's a back and forth. Who's ever at the gathering, they can opine. I'm saying, I don't know. I've never been there. I'm speculating totally. I'm just just telling you what I've studied. The Lord said, how can we persuade the king to go? And verse 21, there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said, with what? And he said, I'll go forth. I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, yeah, you'll persuade him. And you will pervade also. Go forth and do so. And yes, can you imagine? All the prophets that had just prophesied that everything was going to go good were standing there while Micaiah said this. I saw an assembly and God sent a lying spirit to all your hundreds of prophets. One came and slapped him and said, oh, dear God, your prophet were not. Oh, my goodness. You can read the story later. Then we hear of another assembly. One that Isaiah was privy to. And we read in Isaiah chapter 6, <clears throat> verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. It seems sort of to be recurring that God, as, as, as the, the judge or whatever, he, there's a throne there in that place where he sits, and they gather on one side and on the other side his sons, his angels, and, and there's a council. And there's like a conversation going back and forth. And anyway, he saw him, and he said his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flied. Now at least we see one character that was there 
at this assembly, maybe in every assembly. So we see this creature with six wings present there at that assembly with two covering his face, with two his feet, and with the other two he went from here to there. And it says, and each one of the seraphim cried out to another. Now these seraphim were represented in the ark, in the instructions that God gave Moses to make. On the cover of the ark that you could take off and put things inside the ark, there was two uh, seraphims that were facing each other and looking down into the ark and extending their wings. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke. So there was a door. There was an entrance into this assembly room or courthouse. The posts of the door would move. As they cried, holy, holy, the earth is full of his glory. And the house was filled with smoke. There was an occasion we read in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 10. That when uh, the temple of Solomon was inaugurated. That it says in 1 Kings 8, 10, it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place. The cloud filled the house of the Lord. Now, the holy place, well, that was where the most holy place was where the ark was, and there there, there was a cloud and smoke because and, God's presence was there. But now it came and filled the whole house, the whole temple. Verse 11 says the priest couldn't stand to minister because of that cloud, because of the glory of God that had filled the house of the Lord. So here we see that the presence of the Lord the glory of the Lord is like smoke. I shared with, on Friday with the young people a little bit about God's presence, how it's like smoke, and how the reaction that the smoke causes. Uh, as a beekeeper, I use uh, smoke for, and it has a, a, a quieting effect tranquilizing all the bees stop their work and bow down their heads and start eating the golden nectar of, of uh, honey back to Isaiah he hears the Lord asking somebody or some group a question we read in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, I Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then Isaiah, after he had been, you remember, he, he would, by seeing the holiness and hearing the holiness of God, although he was a prophet, he felt so unworthy and so sinful and he cried out my lips are totally sinful and then an angel came and grabbed with some tongs the tongs are like a, a, a large uh, instrument that you can grab things with and he went to the altar and took a blood-stained uh, piece of coal that was red and full of fire and brought it and touched the prophet's Isaiah's lips, and he said, this has touched your lips, you are now cleansed. Very interesting, though, because the coal of the altar, the blood fell upon the coal. So it was a coal that was embedded with blood. And blood was not shed for angels. So we see the angel was not, couldn't grab it with his hand. It wasn't going to burn him. 
But he had to use long tongues and grab it and, and with that, stretch it out and touch. It was not for him. He said, whom shall I send, I heard, and who will go for us? And then I, Isaiah says, then I said, here am I. It like he became, once he was cleansed, he was able to get through that door, get a little bit closer and hear what was going on. Wow, interesting. He was being a part of that some assembly. And as he got near, he said, I began to hear after he was cleansed, I began to hear God speak. And that's what he said. And then he said, he participated. <laughs> Prophet participated in the heavenly gathered with the seraphim and, and with the angels and probably Satan there. If that, he was there and all the, I don't know why not. And he said, excuse me, you're looking for somebody? Send me. The use of the plural pronouns, we and us, as applicable to God, has occurred several times in the Old Testament. One in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God said, let us make man in our image. That's probably why John wrote that all things were created by the word which was made flesh, which is Jesus. And yet we read that God created. Oh, well, this now makes sense. God said, hey, let us make man in our image. And then again in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 6, they were building a tower of Babel. It was like an act of idolatry to get as near the stars they could to God's world. And Jehovah said, go, let us go down and there confound their language. Let us. So that us came down, stopped the construction by changing their language. Actually, I think he was doing an ancient manipulating of genes. Because suddenly, you have a one with one gene, start speaking one language, and the other one way out there have the other language. And, and they couldn't understand each other. And they started saying, No. Hello. And how? And here's over there. And how? And another one. And how? And how? And there all the Chinese got together. And oh, you have slanted eyes too. So that way the nations were separated and formed. Very interesting. I'm speculating, of course, it doesn't say that, but it does say that he gave them several languages and they couldn't understand each other, so the carpenter couldn't talk to the mason and the construction had to stop. But humanity went on and the nations were formed. So we know that they gather for assemblies of some sort and we sort of know partially who was there. We don't know how often, how long they last, or if it's perpetual, once a month, once a heavenly year, or whatever. I mean, we know one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. If it's that way, and we have 5,000 years since, since Adam, according to the Jews, then, then they've had five. I don't know. We also know that Jesus said, that there would be 
a court where people are judged and nations are judged. So let us look and consider a courtroom. I know all we know is about what our courtroom would be like. And so we know that who was present, for instance, we know that there's uh, witnesses there that are allowed to come, some that are for the accused, others that are against the accused. And so they sit up there in the, in the chairs, in the courtroom, and then you have the accuser, which is a lawyer. He uses the law that was broken to accuse the defendant. And then there is a defense attorney who represents the accused person and speaks in defense of the actions and seeks to have the accusation dismissed. Then in a courtroom, we have a judge who is aware and knows very well the law and the consequences of breaking the law according to what you do with so many years of jail. There's a maximum, there's a minimum, and I decide. And he is the one that will impartially listen to all parts and decide whether to condemn or to acquit. Paul, writing to the Romans, asked the question, who is the one that accuses and condemns? So who is the one making accusation or who is the plaintiff? or the district attorney. In Romans chapter 8, 33, he says, who shall lay anything to charge the God's elect when it's God that justifies? Verse 34, who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died. Yes, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of the Father and also makes intercession for us. Oh, he makes intercession for us. So there's one that condemns, there's one that judges, and the ones that defends. So the person making the accusation in our courtroom is called a plaintiff, the defense attorney that represents, and he also has in the courtroom a defense attorney that represents the accused and the judge and those witnesses. Hebrews says, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Are they all, are they the sons of God that are present in those assemblies? Maybe. Are there demons there also? Well, we just read about that one assembly that there was a lying spirit there in one of that assembly. And who condemns? Well, that's the district attorney. Who's the tempter and the accuser? Matthew 4 writes, the tempter came, Satan, and said to him, Jesus, in the desert after 40 days of fasting, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. We also read in Genesis how the serpent that was very crafty. Oh, yes, lawyers are very crafty, aren't they? And he tempted the woman. We read in Revelation, the accuser of our brother, which is Satan, who accuses them day and night before the Lord. Huh, wait a minute now. Maybe it's a per permanent assembly. Maybe it's open all the time because it says the devil is the accuser. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. For the accuser of our brothers is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. So I wonder. I mean, 
he could go there day and night just to accuse me. And he's probably right. So I can keep him busy. Maybe I know you guys, the devil doesn't have anything to accuse you of, but, but in my case, I could probably keep him quite busy. Anyway, every day, day and night, he accuses us before God. Wow. Wow. So to answer Paul's writing to Romans, who shall lay anything against the charge of God's elect? In the first place of that epistle, he says the believers are the elect. So who is it that accuses? Satan. And his hordes, maybe, I don't know. Or his representatives, maybe. And who is the defense attorney that makes intercession for and defends the accused? We read in Romans again, chapter 8 and verse 34, Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died. Yes, rather, that is risen again, and who is also even at the right hand of God and that makes intercession for us. Christ, Jesus. Oh my goodness. Day and night, there's an accuser, there's God there listening to all these accusations and sitting behind him is Jesus defending me. Oh my. So I, there's hope there. Jesus, yes, it's true, but, but, he did that, but why did he do that? Let's qualify his actions. What was his intentions? What was in his heart? What did he want to do and it didn't come out like he wanted to do? So he's there defending us. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm sorry I keep you so busy. Our defense attorney. Spoiler, you know what a spoiler is, right? When you tell somebody what happens in a movie that they haven't seen yet, spoiler, the defense re attorney that defends me, he's the son of God. Wow, how about that? He loves the father, he said, the father loves me. So Satan said, John did this, and he turns, uh, what do you think, son? That's not justice. It can't be the defendant attorney. He's the son of the judge. What hope do I have? So one thing that the defense attorney, being the son of the judge, he knows the judge very well. He knows how his father thinks. He knows what to say to his father. He knows that his father knows our hearts, that even we don't know why we do things that we do. And another thing that the defense attorney does is either himself or one of his aides he prepares the accused for his day in court. So it's not that he drags us from jail and there we are in a court. Oh, oh what's I don't know what to say. Uh, no, no, no. He sits down and said, okay, look, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go to court. There's going to be a judge there. I'm going to be there as your defense. Satan will be there as your accuser. Don't get scared. Let me talk. If they ask you questions, ask you this question, answer it this way. He prepares us for our court appearance. And all the time of Jesus' ministry, he told people how to prepare themselves for that great day of judgment that was coming. He was always talking about the judgment. 
It's going to happen. You're going to be there. But I'm going to tell you how to get ready for that day. How not to worry, how not to panic when that day's come because you do this, do this, do this, do this, and you'll be ready for your court date. One day when Jesus was here, he was speaking to the fact that I've been here, but I'm not going to be here all my life. I'm soon going to go. But I won't leave you alone. In John 14, 16, he said, I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he might abide with you forever. And like I said, the word comforter in Greek is paraclete, which means advocate, like a lawyer, advocate, a helper. And so we have the cloud of witnesses, angels, maybe demons too, Satan the accuser, like he stood before Job, accusing him. So then we know there's going to be a final judgment. There will be in the end a great courtroom where great and small will be judged and we will all be judged. Are you ready? You might say, I'm young. Oh, I got 50 years yet. Do you know that you do? Maybe you don't. So get ready. Don't wait until you think you're sick and you're going to die. Might be an accident there. You won't have time. So go and read what Jesus told others how to prepare. Jesus predicted it. He said in John 5, 25, truly, truly, I say unto you, when Jesus said truly, truly, it means pay attention. This is important. There's a mark on this. The hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Marvel not at this, verse 28, for the hour is coming in which all that are in graves will hear his voice and they'll come forth. Verse 29, they that have done good to the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. And then John in Patmos, he saw the future. And it's written in, in Revelation 20, 11, he said, I saw there was a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and found no place for them. Now I know you're thinking, oh, I'm okay. I'm going to die, go to the judgment. I'm going to see Jesus. And you're thinking about that that nice picture, the Lord's my shepherd, you know, the face of that kind Jesus. But wait a minute. Do you remember what we just sang? His eyes were what? Fire. What John, the Jesus that John saw in the future that was going to judge and be there on the throne. Oh, my goodness. It's scary. No, it's not that little, oh, hi, Jesus, how you doing? I got here. No, no, no. Flaming fire in his mouth, the sword and the angels and the fire. Oh, my goodness. You say, oh, my God, I'm in trouble. <laughs> if this is Jesus, I'm in trouble because I never saw him. And many, all they saw is a light. All they see is a light. And some say, I think it was the feet I saw. I don't know, but I did never saw his face. Just imagine that. Here we are. What's this? You're going to be judged. What's that? According to all you've done. And you're going to be touched and you're going to remember everything you did. But, but wait. I'm 73. I can't even remember half the things I did. He said, nope, 
When you die, you're going to get a perfect memory and remember every word you say. Oh, my God. Is Jesus going to be there? Yes. Oh, thank God. Jesus is going to be here. Okay, you ready? Yeah, open the door. There's Jesus. Oh, my God. I'm going to hell. Straight to hell. Okay, where's the nearest demon? Go ahead. I don't want them to even, I don't want the witnesses to even hear what I said and see projected what I did. So I'll just go quietly. And he said in verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. And verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in it. And they were judged every man according to their works. Wow. 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 I'm scared. Aren't you? Listen. I recommend you go back and read again. Everything Jesus told people, it was all to get you ready. So take heed. Don't just read it like a story. Read it like you're going to die. You're going to go to hell if you don't get ready. And do whatever he says. I don't care what you have to leave or abandon to follow Jesus. But believe me. You want to be ready. And then, when, hmm, when that court of nations starts, for the first time in history of humanity, the judge will do something incredible that has never been seen. First of all, the first thing Satan, the accuser, the plaintiff, the state attorney that's there ready with all that's written in that book. Who's up, John? Oh, I've been waiting for this guy. There he is ready. And then something's going to happen. God's going to say, and we read it in Revelation 12 and verse 10. The court session is about to start, and the judge says, Satan, out. What do you mean out? Yes, you cannot be here anymore. I've been here since the beginning. This assembly, I'm a member, perpetual member. Sorry, out. Bailiffs, take him out. And I heard a loud voice in heaven, John said, saying, now is the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ. His Christ has come, for the accuser of our brother has been thrown down. He who accuses them before God day and night. And then, well, are you ready for this one? Are you? Are you sure you're ready for this one? I mean, I was shocked. God, the judge, since the beginning, seated on the throne of judgment, Judging humanity, judging the world. He was and is the judge, the high judge. He will stand. He was, what is he standing for? He's saying, I recuse myself. You what? I recuse myself. From this 
judgment hall. And I name the defense attorney, my son, to be judge in my place. Jesus predicted it. He said in John 5, 26, For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in, his, in himself. And verse 27, And has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. John 5.22 says the Father will judge no man, but he has committed all judgment to the Son. Hmm, not so scared now. So, so you mean I'm not going to have to face God? No. When they call my name and come into this awesome judgment, the judge will be Jesus? Yes, but remember, there's fire coming out of his eye. Yeah, 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 I know, but I love him, and I think he just might. I don't know. Look at me with kindness, as you see a poor homeless man. I might have a chance here. So the judge is Jesus now? Yes. Wow. And it says, all the nations are going to come to this judge, and they'll all be judged, and it'll be Jesus that'll judge. I know I'm still in trouble, but I think I'm in less trouble than I was a few minutes ago. To those that are from Argentina, you'll probably recognize this. There's a famous poem that was written in 1879 by an Argentine writer. And he wrote a book that was a long poem. In fact, it has 2,316 lines, an epic poem. And the name of that book is Martin Fierro. Martin Fierro. In fact, in fact, they even uh, made later a Bible called the Martin Fierro Bible, where it tells some stories of Jesus in a special way. Now, it's all about, the poem is all about an Argentine cowboy, or they call them gauchos. And the poem is written in a way like an Argentine gaucho would speak, you know, a cowboy out in the fields doesn't have much knowledge or this. It's a simple man. The gauchos that had very baggy pants, all Argentines know this, and they know Martin Fierro, oh, they quote him. Let me quote one of his lines. Just pay attention. This has to do with the message, believe me. He said... This, befriend or make friends with the judge and don't give him anything to complain about. And when he starts to get angry, you must stand down, humble yourself and shrink before him. And if you do, You'll have a solid pole where you can go and relieve your pain. Now, it was written in a cowboy style. See, this gaucho, he knows about a pole because he's seen, you know, the, the cattle and some of the horses. You know, when they have an itch, they'll go find a pole and, do, sh sh and scratch that itch or that pain. And sometimes even the cowboy goes and says, Oh, thank you for this, Paul. Oh, I feel so much better. So he says, make friends with the judge. And yes, in a colloquial way, he's saying, 
Hey, if you are friends of the judge, it'll be a lot easier. He says, who's next? John Miller. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I know him. He's a friend. What a good advice to all of you, to all of us. Make friends with the judge. What a good advice. Who will judge you? Obey the judge. Whatever thing he, he asks you. Hey, go give me a, a glass of water. Yeah. Hey, let's just make a pie for your neighbor. I've got, I've got a, somebody I know that's suffering there, and he needs someone to go pray for him. And all these things you'll befriend the judge. Remember, he's going to judge you. Obey him lest he be angry with you and follow his advice and commands of his representative here on earth, which is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm leaving. The judge is leaving, but I will leave you a lawyer, an advocate, a help. Obey him. Follow him. The Holy Spirit. And in that day, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man shall come with his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit on the throne of his glory. And before him, verse 32 of Matthew 25, and before him shall be gathered all the nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. And that terrible judge before whom the whole world will fear and tremble. When it's your turn, do not try to argue with the judge. Look, the Holy Spirit has convicted me many times. And in the beginning, I used to make excuses. Oh, that doesn't work. Believe me. Don't argue with the judge. Don't try to explain yourself. Yes, that's true, but I did it because the other guy did this to me. Just humble yourself and plead. What do you plead, sir? No lo contendere. That's a Latin legal term that is used in court today. No lo contendere. It's used sometimes by guilty defendants in a court they're not admitting their their guilt and they're not admitting that they're not guilty they're sort of eh, maybe i did it they say sir very calmly and humbly no lo condendere which means i will not contend the arguments against me and they do this because they're following the instructions of the defense lawyer uh, no lo what? Solo what? Contende. Contende? Container? No, no, no. Memorize this word, sir. When the judge says, what do you plead? Here, I'll write in a piece of paper. No lo contendere. Okay, okay, I think I got it. Better known as no contest, which means you are guilty as charged, but will not defend yourself or contend, but you will throw yourself upon the mercy of the judge. And normally, when the judge hears that, he's so tired of hearing excuses and lies that then the, 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 that the defense attorney will, will say, and then the accuser say, wait a minute, here's a picture. He can see him doing, oh, no. Just, just avoid all that. Just fall on the mercy of the judge. The judge likes it when people, he's tired of hearing lies and people explain themselves and try it. No, no, no. Just eat your humble pie, sin no lo contendere, and the judge will have mercy on you. The judge that we will face is one that loved us 
so much that he came to earth to die for our sins. And by believing on him, that he is the son of God and came to earth because of God's love and his obedience, he went to the cross, suffered and died for my sins. Believing on him, you will not die and be condemned to hell, but will have everlasting life. I'd like to end with a song. It's a song about having Jesus like your friend. It's actually an old hymn. It says, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer What a friend we have Make friends with a judge, and you'll make heaven. Amen. Father, thank you. Thank you that we need not fear death. We need not fear judgment, knowing that our sins have been washed in the precious blood of your Son. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the blood that you shed to save us from eternal damnation. I'm so sorry we made you suffer so much, but thank you, thank you, thank you. You knew that you would be the judge. You knew that hell, heaven's gates will be opened and the gates of hell also. And you came to save us, not condemn us, but save us. Thank you, Savior. Keep me under your blood every day of my life. Thank you for befriending us and allowing us to have a friend in that judgment hall. Thank you, Father. Now bless your people. Keep us these days. Keep us from the tempters, wiles. Spare us from his accusations and condemnations. For we know that you do not condemn us. And if you do not condemn us, then why should we worry what the devil might say? What he might feed into our mind. We will only believe and accept what you say. So thank you, Jesus. Bless your people now. Keep us this week close to you. Amen and amen. Go with God.